I was thinking of words as a way of marshalling thoughts, so ideas and, let's say, brain configuration or something, into a, a way to convey this to other people. So I was thinking maybe it's not the word that is self-replicating, but the idea and the soup, so to speak, is the fact that we all are like functioning minds that can actually absorb and modify and spit out again. <laughs> Ideas, so not words, but words as a way of representing those ideas, and the ideas are the same that goes around. Thank you. Well, your um, the suggestion that it's the idea behind the words, as it were, the ideas that the words uh, mean uh, are the are the proper items, uh, is I think uh, a very familiar uh, idea. It's a sort of traditional idea about how how communication happens. I have an idea, I say some words to you, and you get the same idea in your head. And that is, of course, in some sense, true. But in fact, um, the role of the words in, in that is often absolutely critical. Um, if you've ever had the tip of the tongue phenomenon, you can know that you, there's something you're trying to think about, you can't think about until you can find the right word, and, and you're sort of stopped in your tracks you know what kind of a word it is. You may know it's two syllables, and you may know it begins probably with an L. Um, but until you get the word, you can't think the thought you want to think. Um, and words, as I say, have this tremendous advantage of being digitized, whereas ideas really don't. Uh, and I think that you... I don't think it's possible to make sense of invention, discovery, genius, just by positing ideas in heads. You have to talk about transmissible information structures, and they have to be transmitted, they have to be transmitted in some physical form. And uh, words are a good way of doing that. Question down in the front. I'm um, looking at the brain and, and looking at the analogies between brains and computers, you know, we seem to learn quite a lot. But at the same time, it seems to surely um, <laughs> abstract, abstract, you know, what, what is probably the most important feature of human biology, which is things like pain and joy. Now, I was just wondering, you know, it's the big elephant in the room, it's what Andy Clark, your colleague, says in his textbook that nobody really wants to talk about. Is it actually true that nobody really wants to talk about that in science because it's not a third person phenomenon? Or, or am I missing something? Why, why is there never talk about the most important thing in human biology and brain science? Pain and emotion. Um, well, you're right that there has been a, and Andy's right, that there has been a, a sort of systemic neglect of these phenomena until very recently. But very recently, there's been a lot of attention to emotion and micro-emotions. In fact, I am the co-author of a book which argues that all, all, all control in brains is by micro-emotions. You know, there's no pulse signs or pulse signals, there's no hierarchical control. All control is mediated by swift, tiny, emotional uh, items of one sort or another. They're not memes, but they, they're, they're, the, this, they're what's doing the work inside the brain. There's a question up here. Um, after this, I'm going to take one more question. Would somebody like to stick up a hand? So there's going to be one up there at the back. This, this lady here, if you put your hand up. And then we'll go up to you. What do you think the next step is or will be after post-intelligent design? Oh, first of all, thank you for asking the question because one thing I am very sure will not be the next step is the singularity. Uh, I think the idea that, that intelligent, that AI is on the verge of creating super-intelligent artificial agents is balderdash. 
Uh, not that it's not possible in principle. Philosophers talk about what's possible in principle. Or sometimes I say, well, we know it's possible in practice. We're trying to figure out if it's possible in principle. <laughs> but but um, it is. yes, uh, superintelligent AI is possible in principle and, and really not possible in practice, I think, uh, for some fairly deep reasons. Well, uh, I, just, I just got through uh, uh, doing a segment for uh, Views Night, this uh, thing on, on the BBC, where, where my whole theme was what they're making, the title is, they're making smart tools, not colleagues. And there's a huge difference between a smart tool and a colleague. For one thing, you can turn a smart tool off and throw it away. <laughs> you can't do that with a colleague. And there's ways in which you can uh, uh, probe and uh, test a smart tool that you can't do with a colleague. And a lot of people in the field recognize this deeply and re regret the hype about uh, how we're going to have uh, conscious automata soon and they're soon going to surpass us. I think there are many more many really imminent dangers coming from this new wave of AI, and the singularity isn't one of them. <laughs> There's a gentleman up there. If you put your hand up again, we can see where you are. If you would chase up, can you see? Uh, so about um, second row from the back uh, in the middle. Yeah, hi. Um, you, you mentioned at one point, um, I think it was either words taking up space in the brain or competing for space in the brain. And uh, if I understand correctly, one of the, one of the objections to the computer is a brain argument is that there is no kind of <clears throat> analogous storage space. And I was wondering if you could touch on how, how sort of words or concepts might sort mm. of take hold in the brain itself. Yeah, that's a good question. And first of all, <clears throat> there are many ways of storing information in computers. Um, uh, the basic way is not the brain's way. That's to have registers and s banks of registers and put, and put bit strings in those registers. And that's not how the brain does it. But, at a, uh, but in fact, the brain does it in networks of connection strengths between neurons and maybe involving also, let's say, astrocytes uh, 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 in various ways. And we also can do that with digital computers. That's what connectionist networks do. They have distributed representations instead of representations in you know, little file boxes somewhere. So, um, I think that every, it's very important when you think about memes to do the same thing you do when you think about viruses or, or other uh, uh, biological uh, disease entities. They got two jobs. They got to spread and they got to beat the competition in the, in the host. And to beat the competition in the host, they've got to replicate in the host. And words do that. Every time you say a word or think a word, that's an offspring. And if you don't think a word for a long time, if you don't, if you don't uh, think it or say it, even maybe half consciously, that, that word's going to go extinct in your brain. So the idea of a limited capacity for memes, words being the easiest to think about, uh, in the brain is, I think, actually an important way of looking at, at memes and recognize that they have the same challenge that, say, um, uh, viruses do or um, other antigens. We're going to have to stop there, I'm afraid, because uh, it's after half past eight. Um, I'd just like to remind you, you all know the story, don't you, about the astrophysicist giving a lecture on the Big Bang Theory, and uh, an old lady in the front row said, stopped him, and she said, excuse me, excuse me, she said, you're talking a lot of rubbish. The world sits on the back of a tortoise. Now, he was prepared to be very kind and gentle, and he said to her, but madam, what does the tortoise sit on? And she said, well, I've got you there. It's tortoises all the way down, she said. Well, <laughs> uh, there, there, there is a sense in which um, what uh, uh, um, Dan talks about uh, in uh, uh, a book of which his talk tonight is just one small part, 
a very, very rich book, a very rich discussion of this and, and many allied questions, but it's also about the robots that go all the way down that help to explain something about the structures out of which these phenomena come. This, this book, uh, From Bacteria to Bach and Back Again, I really, really do recommend it to you. It's a wonderful read. And I'd like you to join me in thanking Dan very much indeed for the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much.